thank you all for sticking with me um, here. As, so I'll try to keep it short. And indeed, the last presentation suggests that it might be even shorter because I'm going to describe a platform that we've just heard will probably be obsolete in, in future years. Um, so I want to follow up with you at some point. But what I'm going to do today is try to ask the beginnings of an interesting empirical question in the context of describing uh, an institute that I run called the Institute for Research on Innovation and Science, which is headquartered in an IRB-approved data repository at the University of Michigan. Um, so this bears on lots of the things we've heard substantively in terms of how you work with data, in terms of questions about privacy, whether we can implement fully homomorphic encryption kinds of techniques. There's a lot impacted here. But what I really want to talk about is what something like this can allow us to say about the process, products, and eventual outcomes of science. And this is clearly the wrong clicker. It's like the two clicker problem. So today, I'm going to give you a sort of general overview, uh, very briefly. And then I want to talk to you about this interesting question, not about many of the things we've heard about today, the, the knowledge or the human capital. I want to tell you the beginnings of a story that makes one of the key intangibles of universities and indeed of the academic research section, uh, system, the social capital that is encoded in collaboration networks. Today, we'll talk about within campuses, but also across them. And I want to make the argument that if we get to understand those, their dynamics and their implications for certain sorts of discovery and the application of knowledge, we have the capacity to start to think about policy and administration and our research in new ways and to begin to think about how the university itself can serve as a form of social insurance. So someone yesterday, I believe, or maybe it was this morning, it's a little blurry, um, asked the question, what's science good for anyway? And there were a variety of answers. Right? The answer I'd give is that what we want is a system for research that is capable of robustly and repeatedly producing solutions to problems that we didn't know we had when we designed the system. You can call this, if you will, with my tongue firmly in cheek, the Rumsfeldian approach to science policy. What we want is to build a social and institutional system that's capable of responding to currently unknown unknowns. And we will know that we have that system because independent teams or individuals spread around it in various places produce simultaneous or near simultaneous multiple responses to similar problems. So that's kind of the context in which we're trying to collect a bunch of data that will let us talk about in all kinds of ways how public value derives from the academic research spent by the federal government, by our institutions, by others. One key to this is the idea that most of what we know right now, a lot of it, although I'm learning that we know more than I thought we did from the presentations <laughs> this couple of days, which has been great. Much of it is focused around documents. Right? Much of it is data that was built for the purpose of accounting for, say, a grant. Right? And all of us know that any project, and especially a career, is the concatenation of multiple <laughs> grants and documents. And so this is also a machine for turning data on grants and on publications into data on the careers of people. Because another thing that was said yesterday that resonated with me is the idea that it's the people <coughs> who are trained in the course of research that are a primary vector for knowledge, particularly tacit knowledge, leaving the institution. What that means is we're sort of trying to move away as a starting point from a model of evaluation that sort of says the grant is the input, and that's the unit of analysis. The output is a set of knowledge encoded in some codified piece of information, and then there's an outcome. Now, the problem here, and this is where we're going, 
is that grants don't make publications. People make publications. Right? Grants enable work. My argument would be that work creates relatively stable and self-reproducing patterns of collaboration. It's the collaborations that are the place where publications and patents, new discoveries are made, and where people are trained. And those things, the movement of those things out into the world is where we see an impact. So that's the frame. In order to talk about networks like this, we need a kind of network data that is really rare. I can think of very few instances where it exists. So we need data where ties and nodes to do dynamics can both enter and exit the system. And it doesn't work for, say, collaboration networks because that's a growing network. There's no exit. Once you've collaborated with someone, you always collaborated with them unless you make some strong assumptions about the decay rate. You need data that can be situated in multiple kinds of contexts. So think about what a university is. Right? It's a list of departments, which were apparently yesterday created to keep scholars at Bologna from killing each other. Um, sounds a little bit like my arts and sciences college, but right? people have disciplines. Networks exist. We share overlapping knowledge, so you, know, you can think about this. And all of these things are going to bear on how we form and maintain our collaboration ties. We need to be able to link these data to outcomes and outputs that we care about in order to actually realize some of the promise of this. And we need it for many institutions because part of the argument would be that if we're looking in terms of policy at a system level, what we want to know is What's the overall composition, the sort of contexts for discovery that we are funding and maintaining? You know, what's an optimal level of distinctiveness? That's hard to come by. And so that's what IRIS was kind of built to do, or one part of it. It's the part that has me most jazzed because this is where my research lies. So I spend the vast majority of my time right now engaging in the trust problem that was just described. What that really looks like is hours and hours and hours and hours of meetings with representatives of various universities that go something like, what's it going to take to get you in this car today? Right? Um, that approach almost never works for what it's worth. Universities share data with us and they buy in to support the infrastructure, it's something like the NPR model. The data flow to us, it's pulled out of transactional data sources. Um, HR, procurement and sponsored project records that give us information at the transa transaction level on direct cost expenditures out of federal grants and for some universities that choose to share the data out of non-federal grants as well. Right? Those data come into IRIS where we have you know, built the security mechanisms, et cetera, et cetera, and we need to talk more because I've been exploring newer options for this. There are mechanisms that allow organizations that are subcontracted to us to work through our systems to improve the data. Um, we call them nodes. Twice a year, we fire the data and identifiers, which I've never seen because I'm a research user and I'm not allowed to, um, over to the US Census Bureau, where linkages are made to federally restricted data that allows us to see things like the career outcomes of individuals and the characteristics of their employers. And then we de-identify the data, and our partner, the Census Bureau, de-identifies the data, and then the data are made available under data use agreements through secure virtual data enclave and for anything that touches the Census Bureau through a system of physical data enclaves, the Federal Statistical Research Data Center system. Part of the freight for this is that we use all those data to produce a series of reports that come back to the universities that they use for their purposes, and that we the universities that come in get their users for free. So that's the model. This is kind of the framework because it wouldn't be a presentation by a sociologist at the end of the day if there wasn't a kind of amateurish PowerPoint diagram with too many arrows. But the key idea basically is that we see science investments flow into universities and these data allow us to get a sense of the work that's done with them. The work generates the discoveries and innovations, but critically, it trains people. I'm not going to talk about this today, but we also do a lot of work with the vendor spend about local economic impact. The people flow out into the world carrying knowledge and skills that we can, in principle, start to measure, and they land somewhere, which we can see in the census data, and we can begin to estimate the impact of, say, hiring a research-trained 
computer scientist from a large public, large Midwestern public university, right? that kind of thing. So this is the data we take. We currently have 32 universities signed up. They represent on the order of 27% of the federal R&D spend. The goal um, is 150, which isn't too different than the 147 we heard about yesterday, but our list is everybody over $100 million of R&D plus the flagship and or land grant of each of the 50 states. Because if you want to talk policy, you kind of need the whole country. So that's the infrastructure, the platform. We can talk more about it. I'll do a little advertisement for our data release at the end. If you've got students or you yourself are interested, we're trying to figure out how to build out the research community here on the model of something kind of like an open source release. So you could think of this as one crack at a kind of Linux kernel. And the question is, what other sources could be linked to it? How could it be extensible? How could it be used for other purposes while still maintaining some of the necessary things to do? What I want to do is to get to the research question with these data, which is, how does the structure of a social network, a collaboration network in a university, and the position of individuals or teams in it, shape the kind of and character of the outputs of that work? Style of publications, maybe their impact, training, things like that. That's how networks work, sense one. Sense two is how networks work as collective dynamics. So if you think about a university, Right? The collaboration network that characterizes a university is basically the work of lots and lots of quasi-independent actors working on a common platform under a shared set of rules. It's not something that, say, the administration can build because people like us are notoriously hard to work with in that regard. And if my provost were to call me up one day and say, Jason, it's critical to me that you go collaborate with this person who you've never met on topic Y, my answer would be no. Right, as I suspect would most of yours. So, what we want to get to is how networks grow and change and what that pattern of growth and change means for the outputs we're interested in and for the ways that those eventually yield impact. And this kind of resolves to the question how much of the intangible value of universities that we're investing in with our tax dollars is really found in the structure of relationships and work that is created and sustained by those investments. I'm not gonna do that today. Today, I'm gonna to establish some of the phenomena. I'm gonna show you what some of these data look like. I'm gonna talk a little bit about variation and start to talk and wave my hands at temporal change as a way to explain some of the things that I'm gonna be interested in doing. And so I'm gonna talk through very quickly four kind of cracks at the network. You can think of these as the material conditions for science, sort of what are the nodes in these networks the individual decisions that are made by, say, faculty about how to staff their projects. So one of the things that's really important to realize and that doesn't make it into the policy conversation a lot, I think most people assume that when a grant comes to someone like me at a university, it basically disappears into a hole. And it doesn't. We all know that. We use this money to hire people and buy stuff to get work done. The vast majority of direct cost extended expenditures are for people and goods or services that we need for our work. We can see those purchases. We're gonna talk about how those staffing decisions get made, and that's where ties come from in this model. We're then gonna talk a little bit about the macro structures that are created and variations in them, where those variations might come from. Some plausible candidates are the portfolio of funding sources, the social organ, the for formal organization of the university, a few other things. I'll talk a little bit about the model and give you some examples. And then I'm gonna talk a little bit about temporal change. So. That's where we are at almost the end of the day. So a stylized process. Starts with faculty. Somebody yesterday said faculty are like a capital investment for universities. And that's true. Right. So faculty collaborate or form relationships with each other that generate proposals right, that sometimes yield funded projects. When a project is funded, the PIs make strategic choices about how to staff that project within the constraints of the rules of the funder and the arrangement of the administration. So sort of the funders and the administrators can shape the composition of the networks, but they can't direct the formation of ties. Right. Existing networks condition both of these things, so we know that collaboration networks function in a fashion that tends to bring people who weren't otherwise connected together in a variety of ways. 
And interestingly, once we start having a lot of universities over time, idiosyncratic differences in the universities can be used for leverage to understand what's going on. So if, for instance, one institution has a physics department that is very proximate with a chemistry department and another has a physics department that is very proximate with a philosophy department, one might expect slight differences in the outcomes of the physics work that's done as people move with each other, talk with each other, things like that. So, what's it mean to say sources? So this is best read as a snapshot of composition. So we have grants that pay people. We see the payments to people, these are de-identified, I haven't seen the identifiers, monthly with no salary information but with a proportion of an FTE charge to a given grant in a month. We see who funds the grant and we see the occupation, the job title of the person. So what we see here is basically that universities vary a lot in the composition of their networks, right? where the networks are grants. They range, each of these bars is an institution, they range from about 25% NSF, NIH, to about 95% NIH. They have variance in how much they rely on NSF. You've got some clear biomedical kinds of colleges and some clear more engineering kinds of colleges. And so you can see the portfolio differences, and these are going to shape what decisions are made because you can only hire some kinds of people with some kinds of grants. The people also vary pretty dramatically. So we just break these up into broad categories, and I'll make them even smaller in a second. But the red bars at the top are the percentage of faculty who are employed on these grants. And by employed, what we mean here is receive any wage payment at all in a given year. So this is not FTE, this is temporary graduate students, it's staff, it's contractors, it's undergrads. And you can see the mix varies. Right? So in some instances, you see a big chunk of faculty, and in some instances, a small chunk of faculty. There's a really wide range in the size of postdocs, and also in the size of graduate and undergraduate students. So, there's some questions that we could ask from this. How much does the composition of the funding profile drive the composition of the workforce? How do we understand trade-offs in staffing teams? So for instance, trainees are often a trade-off against professional staff. We all make choices about whether we want to hire graduate students or postdocs. Those are strategic decisions made by a faculty member that shape the composition of the team and eventually the structure of the network. Right? And then there are all kinds of different ways to think about this. Today, I'm going to talk very simply about a team as the people employed on a particular grant, because that's the first simple cut. But you could think about the really rich question, which I'd love your all's feedback on, which is how could one use data like this to better and more effectively determine teams? We do a lot of our work at the payment basin level, so every grant associated with the same faculty member. But there are other more nuanced ways to think about community structure. When you think of it this way, you can see sort of some of this. So this is just the, the, ooh, the number of the grants, the total number of employees. Darker color here is a higher percentage of NIH funding as opposed to other types. And size is the ratio of trainees to staff, one of those trade-offs we talked about. And what we see here is that those things don't really explain what is a pure linear kind of <laughs> trajectory. So if we shift to micro, if we make the assumption that two people employed on the same grant in the same year are working plausibly on the same project, we can generate a network. Right? Actually, we can generate two, but I'm going to talk about the employee-employee network. And so this is, across all the universities, the degree distribution of faculty-to-faculty -faculty collaborations, where color tells you something about the log of the number of faculty who are involved. There's a lot of variance in this. So you can see in exemplary universities, of our number of universities, we've kind of chosen four that are broadly comparable. I'm not going to tell you much about them. Um, happy to talk in questions, but you get a little sense of the kinds of variation you see. These are sort of the core idea of faculty working with other faculty that becomes the seed for the other network. This is what you might call the substructure of the larger network. You can topic model and cluster these. So this is a purely structural clustering. It's basically just a six category optimization that allows us to see different styles of staffing. So cluster one, there's 17,000 odd grants in a single year active at this university that basically pay a small part of a faculty member and usually about half of a graduate student or postdoc. Right? They're short in terms. Yep, they're largely kind of NSF. 
sort of funding. They're the meat and potatoes of these grants. They're slightly larger grants that tend to pay two, or two faculty on average, and those faculty tend to have lots of different grants spread across them, and they tend to have staff associated with them. And these are kind of, you think of them as the R21 in an SF language. There's kind of the R01 group, and the, the size of the petals here is just the log of the number of people. It's something more like a program project grant, multiple faculty with big amounts of effort, et cetera, et cetera. And it works its way up to large multi-institutional collaborations, many of them in sort of social science and public health that are staffing up lots and lots of things like interviewers or other people. And so you can sort of think about these are the, the broad sense of some of the classes of composition of teams against which we can start to ask questions. You can ask, you know, how do the teams fall out across universities? So this is just a heat map again. Rows are universities. Columns are those classes. And what you see is sorted by the percentage of those small one-off grants. So obviously, down here, when you're doing relatively few of those, you do relatively more of these. And there are a few universities that really don't have other kinds of things in their portfolio. And so if you were talking about the capacity to do large multi-institutional collaboration, you might be looking for a university where other people in the network have already done that kind of collaboration. Right? Um, it's a way to think about partnership. So there are questions that can come out of these kinds of things. What are the ideal typical ways to, sna to, st to staff projects? What's the value of deviating from that? If you make a decision as a PI to go in a different way than your competitors, what happens? How do you think about tie formation? This is what I'm really interested in, which is where do new collaborations come from and how does the overlapping space of a university, the units people are in, their disciplines, the knowledge and topics they study, where they are in physical proximity to one another, how do those things shape the formation of the networks and can we use them to get leverage? I think the answer is yes. And you can think about that in terms like here, I don't see him at the moment, but Scott Stern and I. Right? We're two people who are very distant in physical space. Boston, Ann Arbor. We're from different disciplines, distant in institutional space. Economists and sociologists think about things in different ways. We're different organizationally, MIT and University of Michigan. Even if he was at the University of Michigan, he'd be in the business school and I'm in the arts and sciences. But we overlap a great deal in knowledge space. We study the same things, which is why we end up on panels together and that bridges lots of types of distance by virtue of proximity in one space. So thinking about the models of network evolution and how that leads to structural differences. I'm not gonna to begin to go through these numbers, but one of the things that's interesting here is that these networks vary much more dramatically in structural terms across universities than one would expect. And most of that variation doesn't appear to be a pure function of scale. So what do these look like? Here's you know, our four exemplars again. This is an effort to get a sense quickly of what the networks look like in macro structure. This is just the network of faculty to faculty connections. So here a node is a faculty member and a tie represents a connection that is formed by being paid on the same grant with another faculty member. The color of the nodes represents the unit of the organization, the school or college in this case, that pays out of that grant to the faculty member. What we see is there's a big difference in the scale you know, a lot more isolated small clusters here. There are big differences that can be seen in terms of organization. So this is a big social science research institute. The core of the network is blue, the medical school with all the allied health science schools around it. There's kind of a land bridge in engineering out here that penetrates into pieces of the medical school. You know, you see much less of that here. There's a medical school, but this is a university that runs many of its grants through a centralized administrative unit, you know, up here. There's not, the medical school is negligible, but agriculture plays a huge role. You can start to get a sense of some of the, the sources of these dynamics. You can also ask when these collaborations are fully staffed, what does the set of faculty choices that add people to the structure do to the way these organizational relationships last? Ooh, I'm going the wrong direction. This is slow. So this is what those networks look like when you add all the staff and students and postdocs. And what's interesting is, for instance, up here, the orange, the agricultural college that had been all separated and pulled apart in just the faculty-faculty network is drawn together by trainees and staff. 
Right? That's a pretty interesting idea, but it also suggests one of the important reasons for training students unfunded. Down here, essentially, the differences is, are just a matter of weight. This is a university that looks like most of its staff and trainees draw the college that they're working in more closely together, but don't actually change the inter-college structure of the network. And so you get to see these different things, and you think of these as kind of a fingerprint, if you will, of the collaborative possibilities of a given university. And the question is, what can we say about those collaborative possibilities? I'm not going to talk about community structure, but it's another way to dive into asking, maybe it's the shape of the network rather than the organizational unit that drives important patterns. And we can ask these questions that are the sorts of things that were brought up in uh, Lombardi's talk yesterday, which is sort of how do we think about the capacity of universities? What are the actionable implications for funding agencies, for administrators, for others? And then there's temporality. So in all of these, the dotted line is the average of all the universities in the sample, and these are our four exemplary universities. So you see a couple of them are very above average in the number of employees over years, but these are fairly stable numbers. There's a bump in most places that's sort of the effect of the, the stimulus package. There's a lot of churn, a lot of new ties added. Um, a lot of those new ties are interestingly to new faculty, right? especially in later years. Not so much at these universities, but on average, the way the network grows is by adding new people to it who bring new grants. There are more to be done with this, but I think the models of the dynamics are potentially really interesting. And so, what we need to do here then is think about all the kinds of questions we've had about how these networks form over time and how the context matters and how we might cultivate more effective structures if we can find them. Now the challenge is getting the right data, having the right platform. This is a larger species of problem, I think. We heard in your talk some of the, the value of this kind of work. But the idea basically is that these things are costly. So whether you're going with a platform that is teched up so that you don't actually have to look at the data to clean it, or you're going with this kind of trusted provider model, what you want to do is do the cleaning and linkage once, document it well, make it accessible so that it can be improved by subsequent research, not redone. Right. That's part of the model of the virtual data enclave. And one of the things that I want to end with you know, we're looking now at a yearly data release. The first release of data through these enclave systems happened last year. Next one's due in April. Uh, one in April will have 25, 26 universities in it that are clean and ready to go. Um, we're also adding individual level linkages to patents and biomedical pubs. You'll get some output measures. And as we move on, we're sort of piloting other data sources. And so part of what we're hoping to do now is to think about getting people who are willing to use the data for research purposes who can then help us think about what else to bolt on to this particular archipelago for research. And I've heard some great ideas so far. So I'll end by saying, if you're interested in accessing the data, um, woo, blank the screen. Well, if you're interested in accessing the data, the website is on here. You can find it by tapping iris at umich.edu. It requires a data use agreement, but um, the, that's for the virtual data enclave. For the census data, you have to go through the Census Bureau's process. Um, we've just ended, but if you have students or others who are interested in this, with a little funding from the Sloan Foundation, for the next several years, we're able to give seed grants, um, dissertation grants up to $15,000, and grants to established and early career researchers of around 30000 in order to be able to get people to use the data for new and interesting things and hopefully help us improve it. So, thank you.